Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining in the latest monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss building a data strategy, practical steps for aligning it with business goals, sponsored today by Click. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of the session and addi any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Dan from Click for a word from our sponsor. Dan, hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I trust you can see my screen okay? Looks great. Wonderful, thanks. Hey, hello everyone, uh, I'm with CLIC, I'm with the Data Integration Division at CLIC, and what I wanted to do is just uh, precursor uh, Donna's presentation and give you a little perspective as we see it uh, in terms of building a cohesive data strategy. And, and first, you know, if you step back and, and look at the landscape over the last decade, uh, clearly there's a tremendous move to cloud. Uh, and so the requirements for your data strategy are changing. And some of the key drivers here, certainly the movement to cloud, but specifically you know, organizations are looking uh, to leverage the cloud for legacy app modernization, moving the data there, not so much a lift and shift perspective, but replicating that data from core transactional systems that may still reside on-prem. Uh, so they need to get that data there fast uh, with minimal latency so they can build new applications and, and benefit from the elasticity and scale of the cloud. Uh, we've certainly seen a, a complete rise in, in data warehousing in the cloud. Uh, organizations are looking to new cloud-borne technologies like Synapse and Snowflake and, and BigQuery and others. Um, they're looking to reduce the cost, they're looking to reduce the complexity, but they're also looking for you know, better ways in which they can move away from the traditional enterprise data warehouses uh, of old uh, to really better meet business requirements, be much more responsive. And part of that comes from automation, and I'll talk about a, a perspective there. The final uh, requirement we're seeing is what we call next generation analytics. How do I analyze a broader set of data? How do I apply AI and machine learning? How do I pull in sensor data, structured, unstructured data, do more real-time analytics? Um, again, this is where data lakes come in. This is where technologies, streaming technologies like Kafka uh, come to play. So all of these are kind of key requirements that we see, and it's really kind of changing the data architectures. We're moving away from, and very rapidly moving away from that traditional you know, on-prem data warehouse, uh, moving data into a warehouse in a very rigid, uh, structured way, uh, evolving to more of a data lake or data warehouse strategy or both. And, and more and more, it's both. What may have started with Hadoop on-prem uh, and extending to a cloud warehouse where the data lake is feeding the warehouse, uh, moving more toward really blurring the lines and more of it's in the cloud than ever. Uh, both data lakes, uh, data warehouses, this notion of a data lake house uh, where the data can reside in the data lake, doesn't need to be structured. Uh, it can be um, structured on the fly for analytics. Um, and finally, kind of this notion of, of moving to more real time. Uh, how do I leverage technologies like Kafka to do distribution to a wide variety of different use cases, uh, real time, visualization and analytics like fraud detection, uh, feeding data lakes, feeding data warehouses, feeding operational data stores. So the architectures are, are really evolving really to meet the, the rapidly growing business challenges for fresh data, faster insights, faster decision making. You know, from our perspective, one of the key things here is how do you keep up and, and meet your evolving data architecture with the data integration strategy uh, that helps get you there. Uh, so you really need to think about how do you modernize and, and importantly automate the process of data integration and building these pipelines. From our perspective, it's, it's really about streaming data pipelines. How do you take those source systems, 
uh, generate changed data streams, uh, which provide that fresh data uh, to consumers. Um, change data capture as a mechanism to, to generate these data streams, send them over uh, the network to your cloud, to your data lake. Uh, it's a very efficient way in real time to do that. Um, but also, how do you build analytics-ready data for a wide variety of different use cases? So, you know, the first one is how do I create an operational data store or how do I move it into uh, a real-time um, database that is uh, completely in sync with my transactional system? Or how do I publish these changed data streams into Kafka for a variety of uses? So this is about taking committed changes on those backend systems and replicating those in real time. Uh, another use case is around data warehouse and specifically data warehouse automation. Now, it's not good enough to just think about moving to a snowflake uh, without changing the way in which uh, your data warehouse is, is being developed and maintained, right? Taking that traditional ETL approach uh, of over the last 20 years and just replicating that with your new Snowflake data warehouse, you're not going to get any of the agility or, or benefits that you hope to. So you really need to think about how do I take a model-driven approach to defining my data warehouse um, from that, the, the ETL code is generated. It's pushed down into the engines like the Snowflakes or BigQueries or Synapse uh, for execution and continuous updating. Similar approach to data lakes, right? It's easy to throw data into a data lake. Uh, it's much more difficult to have a conformed data set that's analytics ready and easy for a business user to find and discover. So being able to do the, the, the merge capabilities on all of this, uh, all this data and importantly, being able to catalog uh, the information. So providing a, a catalog from a, a data engineering perspective, as I generate these data pipelines, I'm automatically registering those data sets into the catalog. I'm automatically applying some governance like uh, detection of PII data and remediation or masking uh, quality steps as I move that data to ensure that the data is, is going to be uh, fit for purpose making it easy for business users to, to shop for that data, to prepare it if necessary to a derivative data set. And most importantly, you know, not just finding the data, but how do I consume that data? How do I provision that data out for consumption through BI tools like Click or Tableau or Power BI, uh, AI or ML tools, data science tools, whatever requirement is needed. Uh, and being able to go from the catalog to uh, any BI tool like a Power BI or Click or Tableau uh, you need to be able to do that to meet the diverse uh, requirements just on the BI side. So this is our perspective from a from a data integration uh, landscape. The, the key things to to consider one is is real time moving to more change capture and movement. It meets the business requirements of fresh data. Uh, it's a very efficient way to move data into the cloud, but it needs to be uh, together with automation. Right? It's not good enough just to move that data into the cloud. You need to be able to uh, provide continuous updates to be able to resolve changes to source systems in an automated way, push down processing. You need a solution that serves a wide variety of different sources and targets, and those targets seem to be continually changing. You need to provide a catalog that will also govern, uh, and you need to be able to provision this data out for whatever use case is required. And what I've been talking about here is kind of that you know, from the raw data to analytics ready data. Uh, I'm not really talking about the other piece of Click, which is about analytics. Um, you know, Click takes the analytics ready data in the catalog and goes the full mile using augmented analytics, uh, natural language and conversational analytics to surface insights immediately from that data set. So, you know, our customers go from complex systems like SAP or mainframe data on on prem. Um, move that data into the cloud, may move it into a warehouse or data lake, bring it directly into uh, Click Analytics and our surfacing insights. Doing that all from a point and click perspective. This is, this is where modern organizations need to get to to start driving better insights faster. The final thing I'll, I'll say, you know, I don't envy enterprise architects. Uh, the only constant is change, right? We spend a lot of time with enterprise architect teams, and it's usually 
the, the people in the organization that start along this journey, their whiteboard looks a lot like this. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of change. So building out a data strategy and an integration strategy that's designed to support you today and in the future, because what you're building for today will definitely change <laughs> next year. Uh, you know, look at the past 10 years and the, the rapid amount of change in different technologies and approaches, um, you know, helping to build a future-proof architecture uh, and, and planning for change is absolutely essential. So that's our perspective. With that, Donna, I will uh, stop sharing and I'll hand it to you. Dan, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for this great presentation. And uh, if you have any questions for Dan or about Click, you may submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and he will be joining Donna in the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Now let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, I will get out of the way and let Donna start her presentation. Donna, hello and welcome. Oh, you're muted. Donna, are you there? You're muted. Can you all hear me? I want to make sure I'm heard. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. All right, Donna, we're, I see you're still muted. I'm not sure. All right. I'm going to risk it here, and Donna, I'm going to unmute you. Are you there? Thank you. I was hoping you would do that. And for some reason, I'm wondering if you can move the slides as well. No worries. Um, it's always a for some it's reason, the, the interface is frozen. Okay, oh. thank you so much. So, as Shannon said, if we can move to the next slide. Apologies for that technical difficulty. And I no longer can yeah. see the slides, so I'm going to trust you along as we say <laughs> move slides. There's always something. Um, so, this is the first, uh, the second of a monthly series. Um, where each month we do have a different topic. Today is the topic of the hour, which is data strategy. Um, and glad so many of you, and I see some familiar faces, are uh, able to join. Um, as always, all of the previous, if you missed last month and you wanted to, to catch it, you can um, see everything on the Dataversity website. And there is a, a full agenda coming up for the rest of the year. Um, so we hope you can join them as well. So if we go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit on what we're going to cover today. So um, data strategy is one of those things that can seem like a daunting task, right? Just the word strategy, um, it feels like it's just, you know, over overwhelming or, or sort of a high in the clouds type of thing. Um, but so many companies, and we'll talk more about that because um, data is, is hot. More, more and more companies are looking to develop a data strategy. So what this webinar will try to do, and if you've been to my other webinars, I try to do this, is really demystify some of these topics, as Dan said, can seem, you know, we don't envy the job of a data architect, although I kind of do because it's fun, um, but there's a lot to cover. Um, and so what I try to do in these webinars is keep it practical, keep it concrete, and hopefully share some experiences of what we see in our practice to really keep it simple ways to get started on what can be a daunting task. So if we move to the next slide, um, unless you've been living under a rock, <laughs> you've probably heard about the data-driven business. Um, and that's a great thing. It's a great time to be in data, especially for folks like myself um, who love to see themselves as both a data person, but also a bit of a business person. I mean, my first degree was in economics. I, I, I really like to be able to blend the two, and this is the time to do that. Um, I apologize for the data quality people on the call. There is a typo on this, but the data scientist being the sexiest job of the 21st century, I think that should be data architect, but I'll, I'll follow up with Harvard after the call. But you've probably heard that quote, right? Data scientist, sexiest job of the 21st century, because data is hot, because it has 
business value. Not not that, and for the curmudgeons on the call, I think a lot of us could say it's, it's been driving business for decades, right? Um, but I do think with some of the tools, and, and, and Dan captured it in the beginning, there's just a lot more opportunity and some really fun tech that you can use to really drive that business. So going to the next slide, um, one of the, the other interesting pieces of it, and, and Click is, is definitely the sponsor, is, is part of this as well, this idea of the citizen data scientist or the self-service data analyst. Um, because, as I mentioned, even with myself, I sort of went from data person blurring into business person. A lot of people are going the other way, right? So being a business person and saying, hey, I want to get my hands on this data, especially with some of the tools that are more slick and, and easier to use. Um, having these sort of unicorn people that can wear both hats and be both a technical person and a business person. If you are one of those unicorn people, purple people, I've heard a lot of different words to describe that type of person, this is the time for you because there's a lot of opportunity in data to really help drive the business, and that's where a data strategy really sings. So if we move to the next slide, on that note, if you are this type of person and you want to have that, quote, seat at the table, um, this is the time to do it um, be, because there are a lot of opportunities through data. And I know in our practice, um, C-level people, um, business people are dying for someone who can really explain to this in a concrete way. So gone are the days where, and I've been in those days where you're locked in the server room in the basement, although maybe some of you still are and calling in today from the basement. Um, we can we can be in the in the corner office with the windows um, because people are looking for a way to really demystify data and put it in practical terms and that's what we try to do in our, in our um, engagements but I think that's something you can do too of instead of only looking at the tech um, also think of the tech applied to business benefits so moving to the next slide. Um, what is a data strategy? I, I mentioned, first. firstly, I am a data architect by heart, and we love to start with our definitions. We could put this in the business glossary, right, <laughs> or their data model. Um, but, but terms are important. The words we use have a lot of meaning. And as I mentioned, strategies are becoming more and more the norm. Um, and, and I've had sort of people ask me, well, isn't that just data management renamed? Haven't we been doing this for a long time? Isn't a data strategy just sort of understanding what we need to do with our data? And there, there's some truth to that. And even what we call a strategy, I, I've seen different, different differ from com company to company. So, um, but what I see, if you go back to sort of the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, I think it sums it up well. When you think, look at the words that are used when we talk about management. Judicious means we're kind of managing, conducting, doing, organizing, and I think a lot of us in data management are good at that. We're sort of putting the ducks in a row and organizing the books in the bookshelf. That doesn't instill, you know, visions of grandeur, right, or, or really business strategy. Um, so when you look at strategy, it's, it's plans towards a goal. It's achieving evolutionary success. It's the art and science of meeting the enemy under advantageous conditions. It's a little more you know, big picture and, and more visionary. Um, and it is more of that, that business lens. And so I think a lot of us on this call are typically architect types to put on less of our, this is what we need to do, and these are the, the tasks I need to accomplish today, but put on more of that truly strategic hat and think what are the goals and objectives and vision that we want to align with this company. And it's a slight difference, uh, but it's a big one because, you know, I think sometimes we are seen as a curmudgeon. Well, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, and maybe it won't, but think of why and what we could do instead to really meet that goal. So if we move to the next slide, um, data, as I mentioned, is hot. And this is, um, though, Shannon generally sends out a, an email after this, and there's a link in the back for a white paper. We've been doing these yearly. Um, so this quotes from both the 2019 and the 2020 paper that consistently say the same thing. The majority of organizations do see data as a strategic asset, 70% um, said um, it's probably even higher. That's from the 2019 report. Um, and 68% and and are looking to save costs and increase efficiency. So you might say there, I think that's always true. I'm surprised it's not 100%. Who doesn't want to save money and be more efficient, right? Um, but, but that's sort of the, the traditional way, and we'll talk a lot about that in this call, of how you can really show the value of data management. A great data management um, protocol is very cost efficient and very um, lean. 
what's interesting to see and probably no surprise in COVID times is this rise of digital transformation. And, and one could say that's a buzzword. What does that really mean? Um, I think we're all seeing what that means. We're all online, right? And more and more companies are very quickly moving online. It was interesting in our practice um, obviously, when, when COVID hit, sort of about a year ago now, a lot of us were sort of wondering what was happening. I was really impressed to see that a lot of the companies we had done data strategies with the year before really turned on a dime and, and were able to become digital very quickly because their data was in great shape. Um, we've got some great success stories around that because a data strategy is the foundation of a digital strategy. I really see them intertwined. You can't go digital if you don't have good online view of your customers, your products, your deals, et cetera. And so this has always been hot, um, and, but you'll see in the survey it sort of has increased 11% over the previous year. I am fairly certain if when we get the 2021 report, it'll be a, even higher. Um, so it's sort of interesting and, and probably not a surprise to any of us. So if we move to the next slide, um, Oh, I think we, no, that's fine. Um, so there's different uh, ways you can really look at a business uh, strategy and a data strategy entwined, and both are valid, but I, I do see sort of a, a change in the in industry. You can sort of see on the left of um, how do you optimize your business through data? How do I become that elusive data-driven company? And, and again, you can argue, Companies have been doing that for a long time. The, the companies that really understand their data are no surprise, generally some of the top ones on the Fortune 500 list, right? Um, so how can we be more efficient? How can we eliminate manual effort and improve efficiency? As important if, in it, to think about how do we grow revenue? How can we have better marketing campaigns by understanding a 360 view of the customer, et cetera? Um, and so doing what we do better. What's interesting is I'm having more and more companies come to us say, I not only want to be a data-driven company, I want to be a data company where data is the product and we're really trying to monetize data where there's entirely new business models um, where you um, might have a spin-off of your current company just focusing on the data. Think of uh, Facebook where, yeah, yes, they're a social media company, but really they're using the data for advertising. <laughs> No, no social commentary there, but or, or uh, an Uber, right? So yes, they're a taxi company, but really they're a data-driven company. They're using data um, from, from locations. They're using airline data to see when airplanes land and how many cars should go to the airport. I mean, they really are a data company, and, and data is the product um, less so than maybe the, the product that's being sold. Um, and so more and more companies are really looking to that, and it's something that when you're doing your data strategy look at the data itself. And neither one of these is inherently better than the other. Um, there's a lot of profitable companies in both both um, categories, but I do think it's an interesting trend in the industry that we kind of have both of those options now. Um, so I seem to be able to move my own slides now, Shannon. So <laughs> that's great news. Um, so as we uh, look at this, again, I, I touched on that before. So this kind of interdependency between a, a business strategy that's going to drive your data strategy. Do we want to be a next, are we a taxi company and want to be an Uber? Um, or um, are we, and what's exciting being in the data industry, do we have data and we need to look at the data and say, what sort of business could we generate from this? What Do we have information that nobody else in the industry does? Um, we had an interesting use case from, it was a manufacturer in Latin America, and they had big trucks that were sort of delivering their product across very rural areas. And what they sort of built was a handheld app um, that's sort of like a Waze or a um, Google Maps or whatever, but it was particularly for big trucks going over rural areas, which have a very unique use case. There's weight restrictions. A lot of these rural companies' roads can't handle it. Um, so they actually created a product off data they had that's very different from their current business, right? So that was a way they looked at their data and said, hmm, what new things can we do? Um, it was an interesting use case. Um, so if we look at, um, uh, this is a framework we have used, and if you've been on my webinars before, this may be familiar to you, but it continues to be a really helpful way that we use for our engagements um, to really think of, have we ticked all the boxes? So where we always start, and what I just spent a bit of time on, is that business strategy. What are we trying to do as an organization, and how do we align that with data to really make that sing? So that's sort of the top-down. 
Um, and then we do the bottom up for what data do we have. And again, it could be that what data do we have to have a new business model or and or um, we have a certain business vision. Is our data in a state that can help us achieve that vision? Um, and we often start with some sort of maturity assessment to see, you know, I want to be an Uber, um, but we don't have any data. So that's going to be difficult. Right. So how do we really think that through? And then we sort of move up and down the stack. So if you look at sort of in this, you know, some of the bottom areas, if you're familiar with the data management body of knowledge, should look familiar to you. These are sort of loosely aligned with that. Um, of how do we integrate that data? Um, Dan talked about that in the beginning. How do we get the metadata around that data so we know what it means, where it is, how it's sourced? And then the next line up and sort of master data and warehouse, how do we start to leverage that for a strategic advantage? Right. So how do we make sure that there's master data so we have that single view of product, of customer? Um, how do we make sure that's of high quality? And then what do we need to use BI or advanced analytics, machine learning, et cetera? And, and the reason we look at all of these is because you really do need to touch on all of these, um, but not all at once. And that's when you start to build a strategy roadmap of it's that prioritization. Um, the one other layer I, uh, that's key to all of this is that data governance later. And you'll notice we call it data governance and collaboration because I'm a techie person. I'm proud of it. I've been in the industry longer than I want to admit. Um, and even though I love the tech, the more and more projects that are successful that I'm part of is the people part. Is, it, is there a culture of data management? Are business people asking these, these questions about their business and about their data and wanting to drive analytics? Are people understanding that the data they put in drives the data quality of their in analytics? And that's the hard part. It's really a cultural change. And the more people are bought in that they can see that the data they're using or, or producing or managing or producing anal analytics on is driving their the, either the, the ma macro business strategy or the micro business of what they do every day is going to make their job easier. That's really where governance becomes a, an obvious, of course we need to do this, rather than trying to push people along and, and forcing people um, to do things. And that's often, unfortunately, a negative connotation of governance. Oh, people are going to come and have policies and tell me what to do. Well, th that is an aspect of it. You need to, you know, finance has rules around this as well. Um, and we sort of expect that. Um, but the more you sort of understand the why and people can get behind it. So, What's key to a strategy is I think looking at all of this, the people, the process, the tech, and then the why of the business and getting that right priority. And why we always show all of these is because um, the, the answer is different every time, but a, a company might come to us and say, we really want to do next generation machine learning and analytics. We might find, well, we need to get there, but the quality right now isn't in place to get there. Or we want to do more marketing campaigns, but we don't have master data around our customer. We can't get that customer. And we don't can't get there before we have the right architecture in place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all tied together. And the key to a strategy is really what weight do you put on each one and, and the order and the priority. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. So the way we approach our strategy, and I'm giving away our cool secrets, so, but feel free to use them. That's why we have these, um, is is the, is good to take a structured approach. And this is our methodology when we go into clients. Sort of, and it's probably no major earth shattering uh, strategy. Most consultancies have something like this, where it's just starting with a very clear approach. What are our business goals and strategies? And write them down. It doesn't have to take hours, right? It could be a whiteboarding session or a, um, you know, a virtual whiteboarding session in today's day and age um, of, of what are our goals? How does data help with that? What, what are external companies doing? Just kind of, we've got some tools that kind of can and document those really quickly. And then what data do we need and what data activities do we need to do to get there, right? We want to have better marketing. We need a, a better uh, data, customer data master and a better data analytics around customer might be kind of an obvious one, right? So knowing where you want to go and then assessing current state. If you have access to a data management maturity assessment or can bring in a, a firm that can do kind of a third party one, great way to know, you know, where I am today and where I want to head. You know, I, I want to get in better shape. I'm, do I want to run a marathon and, and should start training now? Um, or do I just want to lose some weight and walk around the block? And then am I already an athlete or am I starting from scratch, right? Um, so, you know, kind of the basics of what's that gap and, and, and not everything in every area. Maybe, again, based on those business priorities, where to start. Get a good sense of your technology landscape. Often these are missing when we come in. And again, 
Start. I'm, I'm a big fan. One of my, I stole from one of my clients that basically she said, when in doubt, zoom out, right? Which I interpreted as having that conceptual layer of an architecture. Of course, that's what everyone would think, right? But the, that high level view of can we even, again, just don't be afraid to start with a whiteboard rather because this could be um, daunting to really get a full inventory of every single system in your landscape. Um, but actually getting some of the key architects together, key people who are doing these systems and do even a whiteboard session to understand how these things fit together and quickly get to the so what. Um, yes, having a metadata repository with all the lineage and everything is valid, but it's really helpful to start with these high level um, pictures and then the why. And, and I, you'll see, it's kind of small to see, but we often even put, if there's a manual process, put a little picture of a person. Um, if there's three analytics tools and you want one, show that there's three tools. It's just kind of a nice way to zoom out. So that's sort of the current state, and then we go into future state. And just, um, obviously, the future state architecture, how can we make that more streamlined? How do we consolidate? How do we put in tools like master data and metadata and lineage and all of that? But, and don't forget the people side. So what is that right governance and organizational structure around data that you need to put in place? I saw a comment there, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, both are needed, right? You can have a great strategy, but if not everybody is bought in and people don't, or, and or don't know how they fit in with it, that's often we see, we'll have a lot of people say, great, I know we wanna be data driven. That sounds awesome. What does it mean? Like, what do I do? <laughs> and so that's where that actionable roadmap comes in. Comes in. What do you do but all across the organization? What does the business do? What does tech do? Um, you know, uh, what does management do to help drive this organizational change and really actionable, quick things that people can start to see benefit? The other thing that can be problematic with a strategy because it seems visionary and big picture is – um, maybe people look too far out. Um, there, there's a tactical aspect of data strategy, right? What can we do in three months to start to show the value and, and see if we're on track, right? You might want to re re redirect a little bit in three months. And then communicate, 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 and evangelize um, across the organization. Uh, I did a brief stint in marketing in my career. It was probably, I'm a, again, a techie person, but that was probably the most valuable stint in my career. Um, you learn so much about do it once and communicate it six times, right? People are busy. Um, you might think you've said it. They, they might they probably won't pay attention until they've heard it in different ways and, and it's applied to them. Um, and so often in tech, we're just on to the next thing, next sprint, next deliverable. Make sure, whether it's either you or a related team, again, work with your internal marketing, work with change management to make sure that what you're doing is communicated. And everyone understands not only the why, but the what in a very actionable roadmap and how their roles fit into that. Um, so uh, going into a little bit more on the business side of it, the business motivation, um, I'm going to probably go a little heavier on that. This is a data architecture strategy series, um, and I'm, I'm sort of assuming a lot of folks um, can um, know a lot about the tech. Um, but I think, and again, I'll use myself as a, an example, learning more about how to sell that tech to the business or explain that tech to the business is a challenge for a lot of people. And I think what turns a data management initiative into a data strategy. So I am going to go a little heavier on that. I um, hope Hope you're all okay with that. Um, so we will we will talk tech a little bit too. So a big thing, and, and I, I I hope um, I can share my scars and battle wounds and and positive experiences with you. That's what the kind of the point of a lot of these webinars is. I would think the first thing to think of in a strategy, step back and think, um, is are we going more offense or defense, and what does that mean? So are we think am I a startup in San Francisco and I want to make it big and it's all about profitability and revenue and competitive advantage and, and we're in our jeans and t-shirts and we're working till midnight and this is like awesome guys, right? We really want to grow. Probably going to those people and saying, whoa, we really need to think about our data retention policy. Not that that's not true. You obviously need that, but you need to think of your language of, yeah, we could make so much more revenue if we had a better view of our customer and that data was protected and that sort of thing, right? Defense is what you also don't want to do um, is go to a healthcare organization that's worrying about HIPAA 
or a major financial institution that's worried about regulation or just had an audit be like, guys, let's look at social media data and, and let's just go big and go fast. You know, they're probably pretty conservative and really re- more worrying more about risk and security and privacy, right? And both are needed for every single company. You can't only do one. That's kind of the purple in the middle, but it's a spectrum. And part of it is a way of, of, of talking and understanding. I, probably no surprise, um, if you've heard me speak, tend to be more on the left side. I tend to be a glass half full kind of person. Um, and, you know, I, I might be overdoing that when I'm talking to the auditors, you know, who probably really want to think more about retention policies and rules, right? At the same point, um, you just want to get that balance. So some questions to yourself as you develop your strategy and or think to uh, talk about different audiences, am I going to talk to the audit department different than the sales department? I hope so. They're going to have different viewpoints. But what spectrum is your organization? What spectrum are you on? And make sure you you kind of just think of that um, accordingly. Otherwise, I I have seen strategies fall on their face because maybe you will talk all about compliance and people are saying, guys, we're focusing on revenue. That, that's cool. I understand. But uh, we don't have time for that now. Right. So just think about that. Um, and then I, I saw a note a little bit of these need to be a little more concrete. You don't want to be big picture. Absolutely. Again, that when in doubt, zoom out and then zoom back in. It's, that's almost like a data architecture, right? You have to do the conceptual model top down. You have to do a, also a physical model bottom up and kind of meet in the middle. Same thing with a business strategy. For those of you who are architects on the call, I think you may find that approach really helpful. There's a lot of business modeling tools out there and broader enterprise architecture that that can work really nicely to really communicate those business needs. But when we go to look zoom in, um, generally someone is going to talk about ROI, return on investment. There's uh, most organizations, even nonprofits, have to live and breathe on money, right? That's sort of a, a part part of the world, right? So there's some sort of business case. Um, so generally, you, you need to do, whether it's an actual numbers ROI you need to show or a gut feel ROI, again, read your audience. I, I've probably made all the mistakes you will make. Um, uh, go, going to a bunch of, um, you know, the finance department for a major bank and, and not having numbers in front of you might be a risk. Um, or going to a, I don't know, mission-driven organization and talking too much about numbers and not talking about their mission, right? You you need to judge that. But all of the cases have these sort of aspects. So decreasing costs, absolutely. And that's one of the easiest things to show with data management because every, almost every company has a lot of wasted labor costs, data cleansing, manually integrating that ever-present spreadsheet we all know, inefficient processes. And um, I've got a colleague, and he likes to say, if, if you're not doing data quality, you actually are. You're just spending too much time on it. <laughs> you're not doing it well, right? You, at some point, are going to be cleaning it up, right? Increasing revenue, that's often we often – forget or it's maybe harder to quantify, but I'll talk later about getting business sponsors on your side. Can you can you work with someone like marketing or maybe you are from marketing on this call and say, hey, you know, if we had better data about customers or our competitors or about our product um, features, then we could drive an X amount increase in our campaign, you know, um, click through rate or, or something, right? Could we optimize our prices through analytics? Um, you know, could we, there's a lot of things you can do with data, which is why data is so hot right now, to really help drive revenue. That's another one. Reducing risk. Again, think of that offense, defense. But, gosh, I had one customer, their whole point for getting a governance and metadata program in was GDPR, and they did the calculation that they got that GDPR fine, how many multiple millions of dollars that would be. That was an easy case to make, right? Um, but it isn't always only only money. Um, you know, product traceability, we worked for the uh, couple of big food companies and understanding where that, you know, farm to table or where this fi- fish was caught, if there's ever a problem or where this cattle was, was grazed. Um, so, you know, a lot of different areas, health and safety, if you're any sort of food company or or. You know, HIPAA, a lot of that, again, is sort of inherent and, and often can be the easiest way to make the case for change. Uh, but don't also forget protecting the reputation of your company. It could be customer satisfaction. I'll show some examples of that. But how many of us haven't had an example where, you know, they, they didn't know your customer, who you were and, and what a bad experience and you lose trust. So maybe you don't absolutely can't show a one-to-one decreasing cost from that. But over time, you will. 
So the more you understand your customer through data, that's where you're going to get your customer loyalty, your stickiness, especially in the day of social media. Are you doing social media listening through data to really understand that? Um, because that might bite you if you don't. Um, so uh, apologies, but if you've been on these, you know it's coming. Donna's daily rant about data. Um, but hopefully this rant that's sort of a collection of real world examples um, might resonate with you and it might just be kind of a way to think about it. So I am, am, am so twisted having lived with data most of my life that I see everything through a data lens and my poor family sort of knows that when something happens wrong with a bad customer service or they didn't get something on time, they're like, it's a data management problem. Donna, I told them it was a data management problem. And I generally say, well, good luck with that. I'm sure you got a great answer. But so many things are a data management problem. So this is kind of a superset of a lot of problems I am still having in my life. Um, my credit card company, every month for the past probably about 15 years, sends me a, a bill um, and says my balance is due. They've finally been able to, to get that online after many times reminding them. And they still send me limited time offer, enroll in this credit card every single month. Um, so that's annoying. Um, and that's also a waste of money. I am already a customer. This is a classic I'm sure what everybody's mind, this is a classic master data management issue. One Donna Burbank is, is a customer with a single view of customer, which means I have the product and they're also marketing to me as a customer, which is a waste of time and money. Also, um, I'm sure you've all, all gotten these sort of things. Um, dear, I've had this as an example, dear no name, right? So there was a field that wasn't populated because I didn't really don't put my name. Thank you for being a valued customer. Hmm, that went over well. Or I, I have gotten dear Joe, dear Mary, I've gotten the wrong name, dear Donna spelled wrong, et cetera. Um, so a lot of problems in there. But when we talk about being more digital, what if they just automatically paid my credit card? Sort of new, they increased my credit limit because they know I've been buying a lot of airline flights or whatever, right? So this is sort of a real world of data-driven digital transformation, right? So what are all the things wrong in this simple example of just trying to get me my credit card bill every month? Um, you've wasted all that money that they still send physical paper snail mail. Who does that anymore, <laughs> right? Um, and so um, they, they've lost revenue because maybe I might have been interested in this limited time offer, but pick an offer that would make sense to me. Like if I spent more on my credit card, you'd give me a prize or, or something, right? But to say, please get this credit card, this is just wasted all around. You've wasted money, you've wasted revenue, and you've lost my brand trust, right? I mean, uh, maybe not so bad because I um, – I still have the credit card <laughs> just so I can complain about it, right? But wouldn't that be better if you really had that data-driven transformation powered by things like good master data where you truly knew me in my first, without being too creepy, um, but um, understanding that recent purchase history. Maybe we've incre we increased your limit or here's an ad, I don't know, a coupon for whatever you buy. Um, but again, there is so much opportunity, and I see too many companies even squandering it by not even getting those absolute basics right. So hopefully that was sort of a helpful um, example, and you can probably apply that to your own company. So um, KPIs are key performance indicators. Um, to steal Peter Grucker's quote of, you can't manage what you can't measure. And I think a lot of us are used to this in data management. Financial KPIs have been around since the dawn of time. I think even on the Hieroglyphs they have, you know, accounting sheep or whatever they had. Um, so a pretty, and a lot of us build dashboards for budget goals, expense ratios, revenue projections, and, and that's just a given that you have that for your financial data. Are we doing the same for our data assets? We're always saying data is an asset, right? Uh, if, if financial, if money is an asset, we have no problem having an entire accounting department. Well, we have a whole department called data governance or a whole company with data governance managing our data assets. We should use the same rigor. So do we know that that data is complete, that it's accurate, it's time length? So a lot of you are sort of familiar with the data quality um, measures. Um, but then do we also apply how much ROI, return on investment or cost savings this is, is having? So if we don't, I've worked with companies that are trying to go digital. They're trying to do a digital transformation. They want to send text messages or emails instead of physical snail mail that I showed. And they look and they do data quality and they say, we don't have emails for everybody. Or 16% 60% of them say me at me.com or go away at somebody else.com, right? Um, and so that's going to really hamper your challenge. You could do a direct correlation between we want to have a digital transformation and we don't have email addresses, right? Such an easy thing. Um, 
simple thing, um, but if you don't have that, it's not going to be right. So one way we look at this, again, kind of pulling some of these things together, what's your business driver? What's the KPI we want to manage? And what's the business benefit? Is it cost? Again, back to those categories. Is it cost? Is it brand? Is it innovation? Is it whatever? And try to get some, some metrics, but then also think simple, right? So I've done this myself. I'm a data person. I can get really carried away with all the ways you can slice and dice data quality. Somebody in sales just wants to know how is this going to make me money, right? So can you do a red, amber, green or, or easy ways to say, if you do this, you could get this, but apply it to data quality. In many cases, you're going to want to do a full business case because unfortunately or fortunately, part of your job is finance, right? Um, and so you may just want to do a back of the envelope calculation with some of those gut feels, gut feel that that's a word, um, and often it's helped to really start to do a full projection, get finance on your side if this is new to you, and, you know, what, what are some of those costs we could reduce, people time, software time, um, you know, could we have a revenue benefit from some of this data that we own, and, and really get an understanding of, of what, what you could get from that. Okay, so I just spent a lot of time on the business side um, because hopefully that, that, that uh, well, from experience, if you don't get that right, no one's going to listen to any of the rest of it. Um, and so definitely spend probably more time on that than you might have. And um, you'll always have to remind them of that. But then also do look at your fit for perfect solutions in your data architecture. So um, I also, though, we tend to always have some sort of very visual or very kind of use case based example of what's operational, what's analytic data, what's your reference data, and what's your metadata. But think of that in the real world. Everybody is always, oh, we need Kafka and we need real time streaming, and we do. Do you? I, what are really your use cases? I know that's so obvious, um, but what are the use cases and what are we using it for? And in even such a simple example like this, can go a long way because I've seen the wrong tools used for the wrong job. We're using SAS for master data. We're using a spreadsheet for master data. We're using an ERP for master data, or we, or you know, we have two master data systems, or, or whatever. But sometimes just these really simple kind of graphs saying what are we trying to do and what technology are we using it for can be really really helpful, especially for non-technical people. We're trying to say what's reference data. Well, you know, when we have that form and, and, and the, the people's addresses are always wrong, if we had a drop-down list of, of state codes, um, that would just go really far. Or, you know, just give some examples when you're talking to the business people. Um, on my, my rant, I once registered for a data quality webinar, and, and they had free text fields for all of the city and state codes. And maybe that's a data person joke, but that's like the worst way to, to ensure data quality errors, right? So uh, think of those types of things. And then do look at the different types of technology out there and use them appropriately. So this is, again, from the um, survey we did. Um, we do them yearly now. Um, and to kind of see what, what platforms are people are using. Probably no surprise, relational database in terms of current use still leads the top. Um, people love to hate the relational database. It's absolutely a great tool for what it does, which is keep your data clean and keep it integrated. Um, does not mean that's your only tool in the toolbox, right? Um, what sort of keeps me up at night is that high level of spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are fine, but not for massive data integration. Um, and so you'll see there, there's a lot of different types of things as well. And, and most companies are using a multiple platform fit for purpose. So maybe your, your finance data is the operational data and, and relational, but maybe we want to put a graph database on top of that to see fraud patterns or something, right? So yes, but not everything goes into graph, right? Vendors love to do that. Our tool is the only one you ever need. Don't listen to them. You know, if you're building a house, you have a lot of different tools in your toolbox, not just one, right? What's also interesting is going into the future, Relational databases are still hot. They're not going to go away. They're a great tool for what they do. You will see a bigger shift to the cloud. Um, I think Dan mentioned that in the beginning as well. Not a surprise. It makes a lot of sense for the right use case. Again, not the only tool in the toolbox. Doesn't mean everything needs to go to the cloud. Um, but you will see what makes me feel a little better. Those other categories are all getting a little higher uh, because people are discovering that there's a, there are tools and not everything needs to be relational as well. So if you haven't looked at some of these other technologies, do take a look in your strategy. Is there something we are missing? There's a lot of really hot 
<laughs> stuff out there now um, that may not have been the case when, when you were sort of growing up with, with data management or whatever, even if you grew up with data management last year, right? There's a lot of different uh, tools and, and look at them all for the right use case. So um, the thing that does keep me up at night is that I'm surprised when they say, what is your future platform that 35% of people admitted to using spreadsheets? If everyone knows you shouldn't. Um, so the fact that people are planning for that to be the reality does keep me up at night. But we will keep trying. So again, this can all be daunting. Yes, I need to look at all these different technologies and then align them with the business case and everything. But again, when in doubt, zoom out. And, and it's one of the tools we use, and, and I've had some really good success in just an hour or two workshop, get both business and business tech together. And you may have used these before, or there's different names for them, but basically, what are the benefits we're going to get? What's the difficulty? And just sticky note it, right? And you, I've found that you get to a fairly good degree of uh, consensus fairly quickly this way. So, right, what you want to do is the stuff in the upper left, the green. It's really high benefit and it's really not that hard. Could we get an address validation tool out there, put it in, and then our data quality increases? That might be a quick win, right? Customer master data is super beneficial, but it's also pretty high difficulty, right? doesn't mean you're not going to do it, but it might help with your prioritization. Um, what you don't want to do is stuff that's really hard, but not very beneficial. Um, you can read the chart. Um, but sometimes these low benefit, low difficulty, you know, may, maybe it's not a bad idea to get done. So this is just a nice way with, with both business and tech to really help do that, or I guess an agile is that, that t-shirt sizing, right? What's the benefit? And, and what are the big ticket items? And it's a nice way to get to consensus fairly quickly before you go too much further. Um, the other thing to think of, and this is and can be an entire webinar in and of itself, so I'll just touch on it, um, but it, it probably deserves 40 slides of its own, is thinking of organizational capability and how your governance structures really fit into that. So the people and the process are as big, if not more so, than all of the tech. So I kind of weighted this webinar a lot into business drivers, because if you don't do that, nothing is going to work. Um, and then I went into tech, and but don't forget the people side, because that's really what's going to help. And think of how your organization runs. Is it more agile? Is it more federated? Is it very top down? So really think of that when you're designing your strategy of who is going to implement it and what are their roles, both business and tech. And then I'll say it, I'll say it again, and I'll say it again, just like a good marketer. Don't forget the marketing piece. Put, it, put a branding campaign for your strategy. Um, really, really hit that home. Have lunch and learns. Have T-shirts. Have stickers on the laptops, whatever. Whatever is going to kind of help make things sing and, and plan ahead. And as you're finding, ad, trying to get the buy-in, find advocates across the organization that aren't you. So if you are a technical person, find someone in marketing to go for the, to the board with you. Find someone in, um, you know, patient um, advocacy or something that isn't you that helps to say that, yes, we're bought in to having data be part of the business. Um, it's just going to go a lot more way. Uh, further away. And, and, and another piece, so kind of bringing it all together, is how do you bring that into an actionable roadmap? Again, a bit of an art, a bit of a science. Um, but what I would just say, having done a lot of these, you want to do a quick win, but don't do a quick win that's going to be a throwaway. Your quick win could be data quality. It could be a da conceptual data model is often really popular. But try to look at it holistically. So what, what's the big driver for the business? Maybe it's integrated customer view because we're going to do a new product launch and a marketing campaign. Who cares? Who are the key stakeholders? Marketing, sales, execs, right? And then what? And, and when? So there may be a, a campaign coming up. Try to align with that. And then what? Do some foundational things, like a business glossary can be really popular, uh, but that's architectural. And some sexy things. Do some customer analytics, right? Don't only go with old school. It has to be a mix. Hard stuff, easy stuff, shiny stuff, and then time it around things that people care about. So that's a lot. I know. And I talk fast. So I'm also a big fan of that. Again, when in doubt, zoom out. Just think of those who, what, where, why, when, kind of the Zockman framework of data strategy. And I, um, I, I've gotten some good feedback that this is a really nice way that people have used to kind of just, again, whiteboard their strategy. Why are we doing this? I think we covered that a lot. Who are the stakeholders? Who's the stewards? Who's our executive champion? The how, and just think of the how isn't only a technical how, not only how the data is stored, but how is the governance implemented? Who are the people? And then the what, of course. What data, what platforms, real-time batch, et cetera. 
and then the when. How do we time all those together that's going to align with the needs of the business? So in summary, this can be a lot, um, and but these can kind of be broken out into small chunks that align in the data and the business and, and link all that together with the people process tech, but try to get those quick wins. So as Shannon opens it up for questions, because I've seen people being very active as usual, which is great, um, I'll do a quick plug for we do this for a living. If you need help, let us know. <laughs> Another quick plug for the white paper, which is able to be downloaded. And a third quick plug for um, these are the webinars coming up. I do want to give a plug next month because we have a real life case study, which we're really excited about um, from Kiwit, which is a big, um, a construction company that did some really great things with data modeling. So you'll want to kind of join that. And without further ado, I will open it up to Q&A, Shannon. Amazing. Thank you so much, Donna, for this great presentation. And thanks again. Welcome to join in the Q&A here. I'm going to dive in. Is the data strategy the same thing as the data management strategy? Um, the data strategy, I think I touched on at the beginning, I would say is, is very, is a superset of your data management strategy. So definitely think of all of those things in the Dame of DM block that you need to manage, but then think strategically about it. So add that business vision, the why, the what, and the who around it to really make it more strategic and less just sort of management. But I don't know if Dan has thoughts on that as well. No, I totally agree with that perspective, Donna. Thanks. Great. So how do we determine where to start? Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll keep saying it enough that, that that marketing paradigm that if you hear it six times, you might remember it when you're brushing your teeth, right? That when in doubt, zoom out. So think of that who, what, where, why, when. And then some of those tools that I hopefully have shown you, just start to whiteboard it. Just do just do on a piece of paper or wipe or why we're doing this. What are the business drivers? Try to map out a very high level architecture. Try to think of what other projects we can align with. That's probably the best way to start in the who. Don't do this yourself. Um, it, it, maybe it's a personal thing. We want it to be our strategy. That will never work. You want to find what other champions. It's the best way to have your strategy is that you don't, if you're a tech, <laughs> I'm not making the assumption here that a lot of you are tech. Maybe you shouldn't present it. Maybe it's somebody else in the organization that really champions your strategy. Um, so it has to be an us. So this is a nice way if you're, if you're feeling completely overwhelmed with it, just start to ask some of these questions and then just start doing um, and start kind of planning it out uh, without getting just overwhelmed. <laughs> Fantastic. Dan, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say that we always advise go for the quick win, <laughs> show momentum yeah. as, quick, as quickly as possible. And, and uh, Donna, you had a, a, a funny phrase thing. It was the shiny things. Don't forget about the <laughs> shiny things. Uh, you know, particularly analytics helps you do that. You know, customer insights or other things that you can show some some quick insights that that have big impacts. Uh, you know, don't always do the back back office stuff first. Uh, go for the shiny and quick win. And that'll help build momentum and champions internally, especially on the business side. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. You have to show some quick win um, that people get it and see some progress. It isn't only analytics. Sometimes it, I saw one of the comments, it could be quality. Or sometimes showing the analytics is the best way to show the quality. Human nature, right? You can say, you know, our, our customer data is terrible. It's terrible. Okay, whatever. And you show, you show them a report and they come back to you. Do you know our, the quality in that report is terrible? Mm -hmm. But you have to give it some way that people can start to put their brains around. And analytics is a good way to do that because it's something tangible that people can see. It isn't the only option, but it is a nice thing that people can kind of get in their hands to sort of at least see where you're headed, you know. All right. And can, can, you, can you provide a, an example of a good data strategy initiative and the level of detail that is included? Um, Oh, gosh. Um, there's a lot out there. I actually see the one slide, the slides I remove are the ones that come up. I actually had a slide on what is it? What is the data strategy? There's a lot published. You can just Google it. A lot of governments now are having their data strategy. My bias, I would say, I have a lot, when I give a lot of seminars and, and workshops on this, a lot of people come up after, it's like, but what is it? Like, 
What's the deliverable? Is it a big document? And I would say if you're doing a big document, you're probably on the right wrong track. Sometimes, yes, that has to be the deliverable. I would start with a PowerPoint. Can you sell that message and what's the plan um, is probably the best way to start because that's going to help you get the buy-in and it's going to help add that clarity of your thinking. And I think the best data strategies are the ones that are working. It's Amazon.com. It's Uber. It's probably not the big 1,000-page document that you do find when you Google because someone spent a lot of time, but is it being action? So I think the best strategy you probably don't even notice is the Amazon.com recommendation engine because you're using it, right? Um, so that's my sort of bias on that. But understand Dan, any thoughts? Yeah, it's funny. We, we, we tend to get involved after the data strategy has been defined, and then they try to figure out, how do I implement this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so we're, uh, we fall down the next step uh, next step to that, and, and that's kind of what I showed in, in kind of the reference architecture for modern integration and, and automation. Uh, yeah. one, one general comment, though, is, is that once your strategy has been defined, thinking about a data ops approach where you bring together IT and business and make it really iterative as you start to deliver data, as you start to deliver uh, you know, business value through analytics or new applications, how you keep those those cycles as short and iterative as possible and how you can respond very quickly. Uh, if, you know, the data model may be wrong, the analytics report may be wrong, you may need to enrich or add data, that's something that, that, that you should think about as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both so much, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today's session. Uh, just a reminder that I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody, um, as well as links to the research paper uh, as requested again. And thanks so much, everyone, for being so engaged in everything we do, and thanks to Click for sponsoring today. I hope everybody has a great day, and stay safe out there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Thank Sam. you, Shannon.